guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show, sponsored by Arnold Clark. It is Monday, the 2nd of November. I'm Peter Martin. Alan Ruff, Alison McConnell and Mark McGee here with us. We've got lots to talk about. Uh, so let's get into the meat and bones of not only the Scottish Cup semi-final results, the Premiership, where Rangers now have a nine-point lead. And um, quite a bit of sad news coming our way with football over the last uh, week or so, as well as uh, losing Nobby Styles, um, Sir Bobby Charlton with dementia and Marius Zalyukas is just the saddest story this week in football. We'll discuss all that coming up. Uh, you can give us your point of view. Don't forget to like, share and follow on our Facebook and you can subscribe. Hit that red button now on our YouTube channel. Thank you to the thousands of people who are now main subscribers on our programme. That is an absolute delight and we are truly delighted that you interact with us as well. A little bit of good news, Ruffy. Um, um, I, I think Oh, I say good news, not good news for Tadic, um, because I think he's tested positive initially for COVID, so we wish him uh, a speedy recovery, but he could be out of the game, and he's a he's a top-drawer player, but I certainly wouldn't like him to be out uh, with any great illness. No, I don't think any of us would. Yeah, you're right, he's a very big player for them, uh, and it would be a bonus for us if a player of that calibre wasn't playing, but obviously we, we do, do hope it's not too serious, but... Uh, but are we well to go yet? So I'd, I'm just hoping that our, our boys, you know, don't fall into the same category with everything that's going on just now. It seems to be getting worse and worse. Yeah, absolutely. Hi to James Doherty. Hi to uh, Michael Matheson, Shane Johnson as well, Scott Graham, Martin McNally, um, Bodie Connolly, Gordon McFadgen as well, uh, George Donaldson. Uh, and John McLachlan, who uh, obviously has said, uh, rest in peace, Marius Alyukas, and of course, Sir Sean Connery, uh, one of our greatest uh, sons, sadly, uh, lost his uh, life as well. Uh, although I led, read with great interest, I didn't know that he actually could have played for Manchester United, so Matt Busby offered him a contract when he was a youngster, um, but he decided that acting was the uh, road ahead for him. I think he made the right call. Um, anyway, apart from that, a couple of things newsy before we get into the games from the week. Actually, um, I do, I do have a Sean Connery story, if you want it. Oh, listen, can I tell you? That's why I love you, by the way. Go on, <laughs> give us your Sean Connery story. No. So we, 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 when we played Norway, over in Norway, in the sort of friendly <coughs> that we had the national team, uh, we're driving in the coach to the game, and it's like, but you, I can't remember, you over there, Peter? Norway? Um, I can't remember. Well, it was a horrible, oh, snowy, wet, cold, freezing we played it in the blooming Arctic Circle. So uh, we're driving to the game in this blizzard. Anyway, sitting in front of the bus, Gordon's sitting <laughs> next to me. Gordon's phone's sitting on a little table in front of him. And the phone rings. So, of course, I look at it and I see it's like a no number, a, you know, a hidden number. And normally Gordon does not answer those calls. You know, the, if there's no number, he, won't, he doesn't know who it is. He won't answer it. But he picks the phone up and he says, hello, yep, hello, yeah, okay, yep, thanks, yeah, good, good, yeah, uh, yeah, we're in Norway, blah, 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 oh, thanks very much, do, 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 all right, cheerio, bye, mom, puts the phone down. <laughs> then he just sits and looks straight ahead, you know, so I'm sitting there thinking, who's that, you know? <laughs> so eventually, of course, I fell right into his trap, you know, and I say, who was that then? And he went, Bond. James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, so John Connery had phoned him up, as he, apparently he did with all the, the new managers, just to wish him luck and that, you know, but the wee man was funny the way he said it, you know, because he knew I was going to ask. Yeah. By the way, I have to tell you, I'm amazed. I'm amazed that the wee man didn't give him short shrift. I, Sean Connery, I write. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm happy with I'm happy with that. Sean Connery phoning to wish him all the best. That's brilliant. Well done, Mark. Good start to the program. Um, nightmare bit of news for Rangers, Ali. Um, again, I, and I don't think too many Rangers fans are happy with it. The general feeling I'm getting right across a lot of social media. Very angry with uh, uh, Jordan Jones and George Edmondson. Uh, basically, they've been suspended by Rangers. They've broken uh, the uh, rules uh, over COVID. Uh, and now they'll have to self-isolate for 14 days. Now, 
I have to say, I mean, everybody knows, everybody knows the rules time and time again. I mean, the footballers think they are invisible to this. They go to a party, they get caught out, and, and suddenly now Rangers have lost two crucial players for the squad, and you wonder what the future holds for them. Well, you just can't legislate for stupidity, can you? I just, I, I think it's inexcusable now. I think over the last seven or eight months, it's all we have talked about. It's all that's been discussed. It's all we've heard. I think clubs have, have gone through this repeatedly with players about the, the importance of trying to stay, stay within the bubble, uh, trying to contain the spread. And also politically, we know that, that there have been a, a few warning shots already, already fired and, it's crucial that we try and keep football going, but you just under you just cannot understand what the mindset is uh, about going out and, and socialising with other people when you know how precarious the, the entire situation is just now. We're looking at England going back into a full lockdown. We're looking at the, the numbers rising here too. And I think this is when you almost have to have a monastic existence, whether you like it or whether you don't, because the, the crucial thing is, is that you try and keep the game going. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a statement came out from the managing director, Stuart Robertson, and fair play to him right away. He says, the chairman, Douglas Park, Ross Wilson, Stephen Gerrard and I discussed this matter as soon as it was brought to our attention. We are completely aligned in our action and the standards that are being set at Rangers. We will not tolerate behaviour that does not follow the, those standards. It is totally unacceptable for any of our players to be involved in anything that puts at risk the excellent protocols that have been put in place at Rangers. And uh, I think that kind of a those three paragraphs alone, Ruffy, tell you, you know, anger really um, that these two players have allowed themselves to, you know, uh, basically um, jeopardise the, the club, yeah. um, the safety of other people, and of course, they picked up a fine from Police Scotland. Yeah, and it's something Rangers don't want at the moment. Uh, everything's going well on the park, you know, PR's very, very good, you know, the results are good, everybody's pulling in the right direction, and then they get hit with something like this. Uh, surprised at Jones because obviously he was he was out of it for a long, long time there and then he was back in it. Again, the manager was raving about him, saying he's going to get another chance. So just complete stupidity uh, on his behalf and obviously the other player as well. But uh, it's a lesson learned, obviously, for everybody else out there. Yeah, uh, another topic which uh, we want to discuss, and again, uh, our uh, heartfelt condolences go out to Marius Zalyukas' family and friends, because uh, when I read this uh, at the weekend, it just caught me on the hop completely. Marius Zalyukas, only 36 years of age. Former Hearts and Rangers player Marius Zalyukas has died at the age of 36 after a battle with motor neuron disease. Salukas initially joined Hearts in 2007 as a midfielder before moving to centre-back. He played over 150 times for the Jambos and captained them to one of their most famous ever victories, 5-1 over rivals Hibernian in the 2012 Scottish Cup final. In 2013 he moved to Leeds before returning north for a season at Rangers. He also earned 25 caps for his country Lithuania over an 11-year spell. Former clubs, teammates and opponents from across the game made heartfelt tributes to the man will not be forgotten by the Gorgi faithful. I don't know about you, Mark. I mean, that is just absolutely heartbreaking at 36 years of age. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbearable, really, isn't it? You feel for his family. I mean, it's just so sad, you know. I'm feeling it right now, you know. It's a young guy and, you know, what a, a great young man, you know, captain his team and, you know, that tribute there, you know, captain them to the, 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 the famous victory over Hibs in the cup final, you know. Um, you know, it just, it, there's just no reckoning it, you know. We're sitting here, but for the grace of God, you know. And uh, and it's, it's strange, but it sounds like, uh, you know, when you hear it described, it sounds like an old person's disease, you know. It doesn't really sound like something you expect a young man like him uh, to be to be caught by, you know, at his age. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing about it which sticks in my mind about this horrible disease is apart from so many people working tirelessly to try and find some sort of cure, some sort of slowing down process, something that could maybe help people live with it. Um, you know, you only have to look, Alison, at uh, the situation that Fernando Rickson found himself in. You, you look at Doddy Weir, uh, you look at this, at this disease and you think to yourself, 
long, it, it can be a long process. This just came out of the blue. I don't think anybody suspected or knew um, what Marius was facing. It seems like it's been a short, uh, you know, period where suddenly he's lost his life. It's, it's a devastating illness. It, it really is. It's just a, uh, it's appalling, but it's so hard to square too. You see these recent, relatively recent images of, of a man in the, in the peak of his, his health and the peak of his fitness and, and how you can deteriorate and waste so rapidly. It's, um, it's such a pernicious disease. And, and I think at the minute you can just sympathize with, with those who, who are currently fighting that fight and, and those who have lost people to it because it's, it's, it's an awful disease. It, it truly is. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, the sentiments from Hearts uh, Football Club, um, I, I think everybody shares the view, if you're a Hearts fan, that a fitting way to actually uh, celebrate it is to take your place at, at the Cup final, you know. Um, the Hearts players will walk out there with Zalius very much in their minds, whether they can uh, give them the greatest honour, which would be uh, for Hearts to win that Scottish Cup, only time will tell sometimes uh, sentiment and then ev eventually what unfolds. Um, does not always go hand in hand, but I know that every Hearts player will be going full out to try uh, and uh, pay tribute to him in the Hamden final on December 20th. Um, so once again, our condolences and thoughts and prayers to everyone connected with Marius Zalyukas. Um, he certainly would have been a man proud to be at the heart of the defence in the semi-final at the weekend because, Ruffy, out of all the pundits on the programme, Ruffy, only one person predicted Hearts to win it by two goals to one. Everybody, bar none, uh, all went for the hibbies. I wonder who that could yes, have been, Ruffy. Uh, I wonder who that could have been. Yeah, yes, yes, it, uh, but as our, our, our partner in crime has already... <laughs> Put his tuppence worth in. Uh, strict rules are game over 90 minutes, not counting extra time. So you're getting away with that one this time. Uh, I don't have a problem because it means you're cutting his, cutting his lead. So take it if you want it. But no, it was, uh, it was a good game. Uh, lots of controversy, you know. And, and I thought before the game when I heard of the referee, I think it was Thompson was on one of the programmes. He was saying, yeah, this is the first time we're going to have extra referees at, behind the goals, you know, for the semi-final. And, and most of yeah. these incidents were all right in line of that extra referee. And that, that just, it just bemuses me how none of them even said anything to him or said, look, you know, I think you maybe got that wrong or whatever, because when you get your semi-final, you want to win the game, you know, you know, on your merits. You don't want to win it in circumstances like that, you know. I mean, you'll take it, no doubt about it, but it just leaves a, a, a sour taste in your mouth at the end. Of it, and then we start having a go at the referees. And although the referee got it wrong, the decisions, for me as a players, players have got to have a serious look at themselves, you know, and the decisions they're making these referees, and it's their reputation that's on the line. It, Nobody's going to talk about the player who's just flown himself in the ground up without being touched. You know, it's the referee that's going to get it. And that just spoiled it a wee bit for me. Uh, yeah, listen, I'm going to get Mark's thoughts on it in a moment. But Alison, as far as the game was concerned, you know, Joe Newell, uh, I didn't think it was a penalty. I thought he conned the referee. But as Ruffy said, there are five officials there. Five officials. Bobby Madden's looking at it. He's, he's on the touchline. Uh, I, I think they've been, uh, I think they've been conned. Um, that's the first thing, but secondary to that, it was a, I mean, it was a, a game of Hibs going in, Hearts possibly the favourites, um, Hearts, I mean, Hibs at their own downfall, they had a chance to score from the penalty spot, Alison, and couldn't take it, they only have themselves to blame. I actually thought over the, over the piece that Hibs probably had the, the better of the chances, uh, I thought Craig Gordon was <laughs> exceptional, I think, uh, he was an inspired form for Hearts, but um, but you're right. I think when when you look back at some of the incidents, you think you have. I've lost count of how many games I've been at over the years, and especially now with the, the fourth official and additional officials, I almost get the impression that sometimes they're scared to alert the referee to something that they have a different opinion of. I think uh, there there seems to be an intimidation there, or, or there there definitely seems to be a barrier at times. To, to waving their flag or blowing their whistle and calling the referee over and saying, well, look, at, you've got that one wrong and, and this is why. I, I think if you're going to have them there, then we have to see the benefit of it in, in terms of the, the accuracy about the, the decisions that are made. 
Uh, the other thing I was going to say to you, uh, Alison, and Tommy Adams has mentioned it, and uh, quite a lot of people are wondering whether you are in some sort of space station. Tommy Adams says, "Is Alison in? Is Alison in the lobby? So, so there's a whole whack of them here, and that's what happens, Ali, when you put a, a, a nice week extension on the end of the house to give yourself some workspace, and suddenly you've taken the books down as well, Ruffy, which so many people are wondering where is the bookcase or has Mark McGee moved into her main house while she's being <laughs> evicted you know the bookcase is gone nobody can look behind her and people are wondering if she's just been caught short and she's now broadcasting from her new toilet but I can tell you you look great in there Ali Mark McGee players have been diving since the whole game was invented you know just about the, the referee thing I, I can't believe that referees and you know with their their extra officials don't have conversations and don't have some sort of agreement as to when the referee expects them to give them counsel you know when he expects them to say anything so you know i don't think it's like not preconceived i think that there must be agreement between them that when whatever that you know whatever happened there it wasn't their place to you know i, I can't believe it's just random if it is then it's it's wrong because they should be kind of making a sort of plan for it. Um, so, you know, it makes me suspicious. You know, I don't know. Yeah, well, they're all in contact with each other. They've got the they've got the microphones. They can all speak to each other. They should all be able to influence each other if one of them has a better uh, view on it. To be perfectly honest with you, um, and of course, uh, quite yeah. a lot of people giving their thoughts on it. Hugh Scott says it's a double whammy for Tom McManus on Saturday. Hibbs losing, and his surrogate son Kevin Nisbet missing a penalty. Uh, we know Tom loves him, and uh, of course, Tom unable to be with us today for uh, very valid reasons. Um, but uh, nevertheless some people speculating that he just couldn't face neither me nor a million and one Hearts fans <laughs> giving him absolute pelters on this feed here um, because it was a hard one to take for them but uh, nevertheless um, listen talk about Hearts and the last six months that they've had um, I think Robbie Nielsen certainly enjoyed the moment when you consider what Hearts have gone through It's massive for everyone like we, the, the club's been hit and hit and hit again for the last probably nine months the players, the staff, the fans, most importantly, and you know this is a, a put a smile on the fans' face now. You know, hopefully, we we can come together again because I think it's been a difficult period. You know, but we're all fighting for each other. You see that with the players in the dressing room, the staff, everyone at the club is together. The, the fans are together now, and it's about fighting back to to get where we belong. And we belong in Scottish Cup finals. <laughs> Yeah, you can't deny them their moment, uh, Ruffy. And of course, the social media noise up has gone into overdrive. Uh, and I think if you embrace the uh, phrase that came out of Edinburgh, uh, league below, class above. It's, it's just a classic. If you're looking for a noise up, the fans and the players can find it, can't they? Yeah, we all talk about Ranger Celtic games and the banter that goes on there. Uh, having been through in Edinburgh and experienced the derbies, the, the, ban the banter's just the same. It's a wind up. You know, who's number one, who's number two. Uh, and good luck to Hearts. I mean, I, I agree with everything you just said there. Uh, it must have been a terrible, terrible time for everybody associated with the club. The security, uh, you know, whether you're going to get a contract, don't get a contract, you know, where you're going to be. So, no, good luck to them. You know, I, I think he's right. I think the players have all pulled together uh, and made this happen. And I think everybody that said Hibs... Uh, we're going to beat them, had a valid reason, obviously. They, they were on a good run and they'd started a long, long time before them and they were up to speed. But as we know, semi-finals and Mark will tell you, it's on the day. You know, it's things that happen on the day. You know, players that happen on the day. And on the day, Hearts got the decisions and uh, they won it. I mean, I, I wouldn't say Hibs were all over them. I mean, I thought Hibs were the better side just. But at the end of the day, it's goals that count and, uh, and Hearts got them. Yeah, uh, will you need counselling, Ruffy? Because your face no. looks as if it's been. No, <coughs> no. no you won't need counselling. No, okay, I managed to throw it. I forgot. I forgot <laughs> that other wee bit. And don't, don't you tell me goalkeepers don't win <coughs> games ever again. Uh, well, absolutely, because I was going to say to you in a goalkeepers union, you've got to. I mean, I still cannot believe Celtic let him go. Um, he yeah. produced a world class save in that game. Craig Gordon was was unbelievable, Ruffy. Yeah, and the conditions as well for everybody, but particularly goalkeepers, you know, uh, balls all over the place. But that instinctive save, you know, it, it was just 
that's all it was. It was just years and years of goalkeeping that you react to something like that. And fortunately enough, he got a good enough hand to get it round the post. And did he did other he did other saves as well. But you could see the you could see the Hearts players after the game. They they know that he won the game for them, and and that's why they're in the final. Yeah, um, Jack Ross reflected on it, saying it's just those little moments uh, that can determine whether you make it to a final or you don't. And the thing that was um, quite often in football matches, there are fine margins that determine games. And, and for us, we um, unfortunately came out on the wrong side of those fine margins today. Um, I don't think I can sit here and be critical of my players in terms of, one, what they put into the game, and two, large elements of their performance. It wasn't perfect, but there was a lot of good things about it. Um, and those fine margins, as I said, we came out on the wrong side of tonight. Yeah, um, Hibs have to lick their wounds, Mark. Do you remember semi-finals? I mean, they're, they're never usually classics, Mark, anyway. It's just about getting the job done. I don't, I don't really remember uh, many semi-finals. I remember the one we, 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 we sell it when we played Hibs. Um, I think it was one of the games, I think Stevie Archibald was playing for Hibs at the time. Um, and all I remember about it was that we were kind of determined to sort of have the game over as quickly as we could. We did, you know, we try, we went out and we tried to rip into it as early as possible and as quickly as possible. And it kind of worked out like that. I think the, the game was about done by half time. But semi, semi-finals aren't really very memorable, apart from the fact that it gets you to the final. And, you know, one of the things you're talking about, Craig there, I mean, he's a fantastic goalie, but what he also has, he has a, a pedigree of cup finals and he knows what it's about, you know, getting to finals and being in finals and uh, how it matters um, to you as a player as well as to the supporters, obviously. But um, he would be a big game player, I think. Yeah, and uh, the other semi-final, Celtic booked their eighth uh, cup final in a row. It's a remarkable record when you look at all the stats, Alison. Uh, but Celtic managed to, as Mark alluded to there, kill the game off quickly before Aberdeen got any sniff of hope in it. Yeah, I think by the time the, the interval came, they had done the hard graft, hadn't they? Those two goals had, had more or less put them in a very comfortable position. I think they just effectively managed the, the, the second period. And I don't think you can underestimate the, the importance of the win. I, I think if you if you lose that game, almost as if it's almost as if the, the, the spell is broken. You know, they, they, they've held this power over Scottish football over the last three, four seasons. I think that was... 35 consecutive cup wins across all the both domestic cup tournaments. It, it's an extraordinary record and it now gives them this unprecedented opportunity to go and win a quadruple treble. But it also alleviates some of the pressure and, and negativity that had built up over the last few weeks over the manager and around the club. And it, it, when you look back over the course of the season, you might come to view yesterday afternoon is very significant in Celtic just turning a corner and, and, and moving on a bit now. Well, picking up on that point, Mark, you've been on the programme um, quite a lot over the last couple of weeks, but this was something that you and I discussed after the uh, Old Firm defeat, um, which was quite simply Neil Lennon was adamant that when he had his best players back, then he could be judged. And you mentioned the fact that you can get into some games and not have one player or maybe two players, but you can't get into a Celtic Rangers game with three or four of your key players out. And I think that's borne out by the players that he's getting back. I think it's even more than that, uh, Peter. I think, you know, in a game like the Celtic Rangers game, the way it was poised, you know, like that, you know, the, the, the last week, I, I, th- I don't think you can do without your best player. You know, I think, you know, you, you know, teams lose their best player. You know, remember back to when, say, for instance, uh, Liverpool lost Suarez. We weren't the same team. For a while, Chelsea lost Hazard. Not the same team. Those sort of things. You know, Man City have lost um, David Silva. And, and, and they're not the same team, you know. So Celtic can't do without the best players. Particularly against the best team in the country at this moment in time, Rangers. Um, and I think, you know... It, Neil's justified in saying that, you know, look, judge me when I've got everybody back, I'm at my strongest, and then I've got options, and I can play the way I want to play, I can play the people I want to play, and and, and then judge us. I think it's, it's fair. Yeah, Gary McGurn says Celtic getting all the players coming back um, will go on a run now. Watch this space, says Gary. Well, certainly Neil Lennon uh, had the chance to actually just revel in the fact that he's guided them to another cup final. 
We've got a cup final to look forward to, you know, so we can park that for however length of time that will be and we can concentrate on, on this season now. Um, but it's an, an amazing achievement. I don't know how many games that is now in, in cup ties, but, you know, I think it's their eighth cup final in a row. It's unprecedented um, and they've come through with flying colours against all, all challenges, difficult games, easy games, you know. Uh, Ruffy, if you're going to score a goal to get your team to the cup final, um, well, there's no need to go in a huff with us, Ruffy. Um, but uh, <laughs> if you're going to <laughs> if you're going to score a goal in a cup final, and you've scored a few in your time, Mark, um, the one that uh, Ryan Christie scored was an absolute belter. I, I mean, I think uh, there you go. You've mentioned a player right away who didn't play last week, you know, against Rangers, you know, and he scored, a, you know, an important goal for them, you know, and that's what they were missing last week. You know, he's developing a really good player, both for Celtic and uh, for a lot of us, just as importantly for, for the national team, you know. So, yeah, you know, terrific goal, um, a terrific young player, um, finally finding his way as one of the, the, the top players in the team, you know, from being in loan a couple of seasons ago. Yeah, uh, Ruffy, on that point, I mean, the goal for the second goal, never mind Christie's first, the second goal was really down to the skill of Rogic to get that ball across the face of goal. Yeah, and there was two or three incidents just before that. He showed quick feet, you know, and he showed a bit of ability that a lot of people don't have. He can see a pass. Uh, and yeah, for, for that goal in particular, he chased it down. Uh, and there was only one thought, and that was to get it back into play across the goal. But yeah, there was other things as well. I've always been a big fan of his, unfortunately. He's not been the kind of guy who can do it over the 90 minutes, you know. But on, on C60, 65 minutes, a, a player with that kind of ability, I'm quite happy to put up with that because uh, I think he is a quality player. And I think I think Celtic have done well, you know. They was going to leave there in the summer, but I think he's going to be a big player for the rest of the season. Yeah, 60, 65 minutes. I always had myself down as really, really good for about 12 minutes, Mark, and then I started to really fade, um, as, you're, <laughs> as you're well aware in La Manga. Uh, but never the, nevertheless, 65 minutes is, is not bad. Um, as far as uh, Aberdeen are concerned, uh, it picks up on Mark's point uh, initially, Alison, with losing key players. They didn't have Johnny Hayes. Uh, which was a blow. Uh, Sam Cosgrove was coming back from injury, so he was fairly ineffective. I can't remember Scott Bain really having any kind of save to make because Aberdeen really didn't penetrate that final third. I think their, their ambitions were punctured with that opening 45 minutes when, when Celtic came out and, and were pretty ruthless, took the game to them. Uh, but I, I think you're right. I don't think any team can cope when you're robbed of significant talent. I know Mark's just spoken of, of the players that Celtic were missing a few weeks back. You know, you'd odds and Edward out. James Forrest, I think, uh, remains a divisive figure amongst the, the Celtic support. But what he brings in terms of goals and assists is, is extraordinary when you look at his record and just how pivotal he is into how to how Celtic play. And it's the same for Aberdeen. Johnny Hayes was excellent at Petorji last Sunday afternoon when you take him out, when you take out the physicality of Cosgrove when he's not fully fit. There's no question that it makes you more toothless if you're denied access to your best players that, that make you tick. And, and I think any team suffers over the course of the season. Everyone will have to, to deal with that. I think, too, what you'll see is COVID really wrecking havoc with, with squad players and and personnel that are available. Brian Christie missed two weeks despite the fact he tested negative six times just because he was in the vicinity of a player who returned a positive test. And as, as the season goes on, that will that will play a huge part in terms of squad numbers and, and who's available to managers. Yeah, as far as Aberdeen were concerned over the 90 minutes, um, here's what Derek McInnes thought of his team's performance. I thought we were a better team second half. I really did. I thought we... We were braver, we were starting positions, we turned the ball over more. I don't think Celtic enjoyed the game as much. And we got into some good areas and it was system against system. And we um, we never really showed that quality. We, we had three or four shots for the edge of the box, closer than what Christie had. We never quite showed that quality with a few crosses in, a few opportunities to make more of it. Um, but we needed that goal to spark us and give us a chance to throw the kitchen sink at it. But, Unfortunately for us, and uh, it wasn't enough on the day. 
You know what I say, Ruffy, managers like, like to paint a lovely picture of a game that sometimes we don't see. Um, when Neil Lennon was waxing lyrical about how uh, much of a, a better performance Celtic put in the second half against AC Milan, I thought the game was dead and buried by the time they started to mm-hmm. uh, you know, get themselves clicked into gear. And, and equally so with Derek's assessment there, the game was gone from Aberdeen when they were 2-0 down. And yeah. And, yeah, but as a manager, you've got to look at the positives. You've got to look at, you know, 15, 20-minute game when his team were better than what they were in the first half. And you're hoping you can get that wee goal that, as he said there, ignites. But they, they just huffed and puffed for me. You know, no really any clear cut chances. They were better. I can't disagree with him. They were better in the second half than what they were in the first. But it looked as if Celtic were just trying to see out the game, you know, with uh, and just just in a gear, you know, that they could if, I think if Aberdeen had a score they probably went up a gear. Uh but two nothing's always a comfortable score. And I think that's the way Celtic approached the second half of that game. Yeah, John Herity says, McInnes is havering. There's a good old Scottish word. Um, William Gibson says, Derek's talking nonsense. It's an easy Celtic victory. Uh, Danny Kelly says, Celtic man-managed the game in the second half. Um, so, uh, listen, it's all about opinions on this. That's the great joy of this programme. Uh, listening to managers and players, getting their thoughts, and then we can contest them. Uh, we're going to hear from Stephen Gerrard. We're going to hear from Alec Dyer. Uh, and, of course, we'll look at the Premiership games as well. Uh, here's how the Premiership panned out. Uh, over the weekend as far as the results were concerned, just in case you were wondering. Um, Dundee United edging it against Ross County, Motherwell comfortable against Livingston, uh, and as well as the Cup semi-finals in there was Kilmarnock nil, Rangers 1. And this again um, was down to the penalty kick-taking of James Tavernier. He's just relentless with it, Alison, and Rangers with a, a really good battling win down there because Kelly have proved to be a thorn in their side. I think it's the kind of game that this time last year they might have dropped points in. I think uh, they managed to, to see it out. I think uh, in the second half, Kilmar come more into it. Um, again, another game played in very difficult conditions and on a, on a surface that we all know isn't entirely... It isn't entirely the best for, for a game of football, but I, I thought they just they, they'd done enough to take all three points, and, and it really now keeps the, the pressure on Celtic in terms of the title race. I think that's Rangers nine points ahead now, and it's points that are banked on the board. Although you'll come back and say that Celtic have a couple of games in hand, you still have to go out and, and win those games, and, and there's a wee bit of pressure on you then going into them to make sure that you don't lose any ground. But, but certainly, I think if you're going to talk about the difference in mentality, of this Ranger side compared to recent seasons. I think it's in games like this where you're going to see it. Yeah, 15 clean sheets this season already, Mark, tells you the story of how Rangers are now winning the games that they were maybe slipping up in previous seasons. I mean, you must have been bolstered by the fact that when you played in that really good Aberdeen side, you probably had a real look at the back and thought, "Mm, Stuart Kennedy, top drawer. Miller, McLeish, top drawer. Doug Rugby, top drawer. (laughs) You know know you're going to keep a clean sheet and then nick one. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, Alan will uh, tell you as well that, you know, teams defend. To, to be a really good defensive team, you all have to defend. You know, you have to defend as a team. It's not just about a back four and it's not just about a great goalie. It's about everybody having the mentality to want to stop the other team scoring when the other team have the ball. You know, and I think that's what, in a sense, Rangers have captured this season for me. There's, there's a bit more about them in terms of the urgency to, you know, to stop the uh, stop the opposition from scoring. So it's not just about the back four, and the back four are playing well, and the goalie is playing well. Um, but I think as a team, they're much more determined to make sure that they don't concede. Yeah, uh, and Stephen Gerrard was uh, singing the praises of Cedric Itton. Superb man of the match. Man of the match, hands down. This is one of the hardest places to come as a team and for an individual, uh, especially in the forward areas. They've got good defenders, uh, defenders who are physical, who, who really make it uncomfortable for you. It was hold-up play today. Uh, I think Chris Boyd was in the in the box. Um, that was a top all-round performance for someone who's big, strong, hold the ball up. He was a threat. Um, he was outstanding today. 
That gives you options, Ruffy, when you've got the likes of uh, the diminutive uh, Jermaine Defoe at times, Alfredo Morelos, but suddenly you've got Itton, which mixes it up in the front line. Yeah, you know, you're going to come up against uh, teams with different kind of defences, you know, teams you can get it on the deck. There are times you have to change your style of play to aerial, an aerial battle, and if you know you've got players like that in your locker, then you can chop and change. And I think that's one of the assets that the Rangers have done, you know, over the close season. As he's, he's deliberately went down that road after the couple of years of experience of going to rugby park and going to places where you have to dig in, like Livingston and that. And now he's, he's, he's brought in players that will adapt to these surroundings. So, no, oh, all credit to them in the you can't say anything against them just now. You know, I, I thought it was one going on, maybe two or three at the weekend. But when it's always one nothing, there's always a chance. And again, Alan McGregor come up with a save for the free kick that Alison was saying maybe last year that might have went in and it had been one each and it had been doom and gloom. But it never happened this time. Yeah, well, McGregor's top drawer. I mean, the shot from Brophy was literally at the tail end of the game. I mean, they, they very rarely threaten Rangers. And, and Alec Dyer certainly, um, I don't think, was too happy with the way his team played. No, no, I think it's a bit of both, to be honest. Um, I think we showed him a little bit too much respect um, at the start. But like I said, if we go gun hole against them, we'll get picked off. So it was important to try and find a balance. We found a balance in the second half. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to say something, Mark. Do you do you think? Um, I mean, it was definitely a penalty for Rangers. Do you think penalty kick taking is now becoming, um, you know, something that's it's an art. It's it's you have to work at it because Tavernier, um, you know, is bashing these penalties away, no problem at all. He's picking it right in the corner as well. I think it's something like that. What do you think? I think there are specialists. You know, funny enough, I, I took a little session for one of my friends' teams uh, on Thursday night, and they were going into a cup game at the weekend, which sadly they lost. But it could have went to penalties, so we did a little bit of a kind of penalty masterclass. And of course, there are one or two boys who take penalties, and you don't have to tell them. But it's the ones who don't normally take penalties. You have to kind of give them ideas of how to shut out the pressure and technique, and you know what they should be thinking and things like that. But you know, there are specials. The best, the best penalty kick taker that I've ever seen of anybody anywhere that I've either played with or uh, managed is Chris Abalumu. I've never seen Chris Abalumu. Uh, miss a penalty. You know, he would take 100 in consecutive penalties against four different goalkeepers and nobody would save one. Wow, that was not a name I thought you were going to come up with, to be perfectly honest with you, because because quite simply, I think, um, you know, three players that we've talked about on this programme before, Ruffy, automatically spring to mind. Ray Stewart, who used to play at Dundee United, was a fantastic penalty kick taker. Phil Neal at Liverpool, brilliant penalty kick taker. Matt Letizzi, I think, scored 49 out of 50. The only man, I think, that saved one was Mark Crossley of Nottingham Forest, stopped him one day. But um, I don't know if you can come up with, roughly a penalty taker that was just absolute well, my, class. My, Mark has mentioned two. I scored my last two. one. Yeah. Did you, how many did you? I scored the last one I took. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, how uh, many did you take? <laughs> I only remember that one actually. <laughs> yeah, Ruffy. No, my my you can't ask, can ask me who was against, of course. <laughs> no, don't tell me it wasn't it, was it? Was it? Man, no. Jim Leighton actually, it was Man United. <laughs> oh, thank God for that. I meant it <laughs> earlier on when 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 we played uh Aberdeen in the, the League Cup final. You did not score that day against Hibs, did you? No. 3 nothing. Starkey. I think Starkey scored. I can't remember who the other two goals were. Eric Black. Anyway. Was that, what do you Eric mean, Black. Alan? Yeah, Aberdeen <coughs> versus Hibs at Hamden. League Cup final. final. 3 nothing. Aberdeen. Final. Eric Black scored two. I never won a League Cup, so it must have been before I got there. No, it was. I think it was yeah, after you left. Been 85. About 86, 85, 86. Yeah, oh, it was after I left it. Yeah, yeah you'd gone. Eric, Eric right. Black scored and Starkey scored. Eric, I think Eric Black got two, Ruffy. And Starkey really? scored the oh, other. Bro. Yeah. Oh, well, that takes away, away. Off, man. At least Martin never scored. That's all right. You <laughs> know, my two penalty, penalty kicks are, are always uh, David Cooper and John Robertson. Yeah. That's my yeah, two favourites. I thought they were ah. superb. 
that's two good names. Ali, can you think of any? I mean, he's come up with two crackers there, Cooper and uh, Cooper was great though because he could put he could put it. I don't know about you with lefties, Mark, but he could put the ball lefties come across the ball and and put it low into the corner. Davy Davy had that. In abundance, he used to, you know, the goal, the goal against Wales, the penalty kick was like that as well, right into the corner. You had to be, you know, you had to make your move early if you were going to save one of his. Yeah, I think the big man's just, uh, I think so he's gone for that one. No, 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 he's not. He's I'm just, not sure who no, is. Who is that? Who is that? Is that to what, me there? Yeah, I was just talking about Cooper. That's the type of thing he did. He came across his body, his left, and he, he, he put it in the bottom corner. It was hard to save them. Oh, I mean, it was. I think that there's, there's, that, like, the, the guys that are specialists of all sorts of different ways of doing it, don't they? And they, they're, they're all quite, uh, you know, artistic, they seem to be. But, you know, if you're not a, a regular pen, like you, I, I think accuracy and power. You know, you hit it as hard as you can, as low as you can in the bottom corner. You know, that's the way to take it. Yeah, and Sandy Powell says you can't beat David Cooper. John Allen's come up with one, just picking up on your point, Mark. He says Tommy Gemmell, who hit the ball as hard as it possibly could. And if the keeper was in the way, then he was in the back of the net too. And I think Bobby Charlton offered the same attitude to penalty kicks. Ali, have you thought of anyone else? I can't actually, really. Ali McCoy, I don't think, missed too many. <laughs> But, um, no, I'm struggling. Yeah, Nakamura, he could hit a penalty as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of names coming up. Although, Alison, Alison Carroll says Danny, Danny McGrain. I'm not sure she's talking about... <clears throat> I think Danny scored nine goals in his entirety, Alison, and I don't think any of them were penalties. I might be wrong. I did announce one night at a, at a dinner that Danny had scored eight goals in his entire career and he quickly stopped the whole event and said, hey, nine, don't deny me the other one. <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of a summed it up. Uh, anyway, penalty kicks, it always adds to it your, your goal tally if you can slot them in as well. Um, Tavernier is certainly the best penalty kick taker, I think, in the country at the moment, unless somebody's going to tell me different. Uh, Dundee United 2, Ross County 1, Boy United. They're getting it in the neck at the moment, Alison. That uh, amount of money that they are spending um, on the wages is certainly getting them a fair bit of criticism, especially when they're looking for players now to take wage cuts. Um, but boy, they needed that result at the weekend. Yeah, they got it against Ross County. They were two nothing up before Ross County mounted some sort of fight back. Yeah, they definitely needed that. I've, I've seen Dundee United a couple of times actually uh, since the start of the season, and I, I've not seen one impressive performance yet. Uh, I, I, I don't think I've, I, I've seen a cohesion to them. They've all, the, the, the two or three times that I've seen them, they look like a team of individuals rather than a, a collective. So. I think it's a big result for them, it's, but it's about how you sustain that and, and can you build on it and can you build a bit of momentum. But, but you're unquestionably right. You've spent a lot of money to get back up into the top flight and you need to earn the results that justify that now. Yeah, uh, Mark, your old club Motherwell is on a run at the moment. Four wins from five. And Tony Watt, I watched him last week, uh, Mark. I thought he was first class. He was really, really good. Uh, for me, I, opened, I mean, I always felt you were great at this as well, which was for Aberdeen, for Celtic, for Hamburg. Was, never mind scoring goals, Mark, because you know as a centre forward, holding the ball in and being able to bring other players into the game is, you know, a real quality. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, um, we heard Stephen Gerrard talking about his player doing that, you know, and, uh, you know, one of my favourite players, I hate to say it, you know, and his ability to do it, but not only that, to set people up uh, and, and make goals. Um, you know, um, at Tottenham, um, what's his name? Harry Kane. Uh, what era? Harry, what era? Harry, Harry Kane. Kane. Harry Kane, so it's an age thing. <laughs> Um, Harry Kane uh, Harry Kane is j just fantastic you know nothing comes off him the ball goes up to him it sticks but as I say better than that he comes off and he makes goals for Son and he makes goals for other people you know but his hold up play is brilliant but it gets you up the park you know it, it, you're talking about defending it's one of the best lines of defence if you give it up to the centre forward and it sticks then it's a way of you getting out it's a way of protecting your goal and it is part of defending believe it or not 
Yeah, I mean, Ruffy, that is the key to it all. I mean, everybody was everybody was raving about Tony Watt last week and how he, he won a penalty, how he scored a goal. The, the one thing that I, when I was watching the game and I looked at all the things that he was doing in the match, one, he run his socks off, but two, as Mark mentioned there, and I think this is the greatest quality, if somebody pings a ball up to you and off either foot, you know that your first touch is going to bring that ball in. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you know, or even your first touch suddenly is, is to your own teammate, you know, if you've got your back to goal. That is something that is invaluable. And it's something that I think, you know, many a striker should be spending hours afterwards working on. I thought Mark, I thought Mark as a yeah. player was brilliant at it. I thought that was one of his great qualities. But it is, it's holding the ball in, Ruffy. Yeah, and then Mark's just touched on it there. I think every team uh, appreciates a centre-forward who can particularly got a good first touch, can hold the ball up to get midfield run a bit of him. But the other thing with Tony Watt as well is he did something that when, when I was at Celtic, Mark and, and Maka and Andy Walker would do. They, they, they chase, chase anything, chase anything into the corner. A lot of people would just give it up and go, oh, well, we're not going to get that. You know, they, 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 they never stopped till the ball went out the park. And that is something that Tony Watt started Adding his game, you know, he's got a, the enthusiasm, you know, to keep the ball in play, and uh, the the rest of the team are getting a, the benefit of it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks to thousands of people. Uh, Mark, Mark Jennings has just come up with the best person. I don't know if we're going to get any argument on this. Mark Jennings is saying. Uh, Kenny Douglas, nobody better than him. I mean, with that big fat backside and then Alisson, he just held it in and laid it off. It's, it's why Alisson and I built a tribute room to him in our studios. It's as simple as that. There is nobody better than Douglas, I'm sorry. I wouldn't give you an argument. I'm so glad you said that, Ali. Um, and of course, uh, uh, Drogba is another name that was mentioned as well. There's listen, there's a, a thousand and one of them you could come up with on this. Here's how the Premiership table looks uh, after the weekend's games, obviously with the, the Cup teams out of it. Rangers now have a nine-point advantage Celtic with two games in hand. Uh, at the bottom end, St Mirren and Hamilton there with obviously a few games to play as well. Um, but Livingston at the moment now without a win in three. Um, so <clears throat> interesting times there. Um, now a couple of little bits of news that are coming in. Uh, just out of curiosity, just to get your quick thoughts on it, Alison. Um, nine points, it's in the bag. Uh, for Rangers, and I, I think a lot of people tell you, you know, it's better to have the points on the board rather than, you know, speculating all the time. It's a commanding lead for Rangers. Of course it is. I think it's it's huge for them. They've gone out, they, they've done what's asked of them, uh, and now it puts the onus on Celtic to go and uh, and do the same. And I think in in this season, there, there's no question that there's going to be a, a mental element to it. That, that, that there's going to be a a unique pressure around this title race, given what's at stake and, and all the talk that's gone on around one in a ten successive title. So it, it gives Rangers the impetus at the minute and it asks questions now of Celtic to, to go and deliver. I think what you've seen in, in the last week from Celtic, the performance at Petordi when they came back, the the display against Lille, and I know you can talk about the two goals con conceded and then they win at Hamden, I think they look a bit more spirited than, than what they did in the aftermath of that Rangers game. It was a very limp performance against Rangers when they played them at Celtic Park, but I think they look more robust, they look more like themselves. And, and as Edward gets fitter, as Christie comes back in, as they bring players back, I think you, you might see a different side and their aim now just to be going and to try and build some momentum and and get a run of consistency. Yeah, um, there's been a bit of news coming in. One positive COVID test at Dundee. Let's hope it's not Charlie Adam, Ruffy. That's all I'm saying to you, you know, because <laughs> there's a, a Dundee, a Dundee keep putting them up in hotels, you know, that's all I'm saying. Um, there is a government statement that has uh, been released uh, with regards to uh, Rangers. A Scottish government spokesperson says the return to training and match protocols mandate strict adherence to all government guidance in place, including gatherings and
and physical distancing. Players maintain the sporting bubble by not compromising any of these things when away from the heavily regulated training or match environment. And we expect clubs and their staff and <coughs> players to fulfil their responsibilities and apply all of these measures rigorously. We commend Rangers for taking such swift and decisive action in this instance to protect the rest of their squad and the wider public. So that's uh, clearly uh, an immediate reaction there from the government to Rangers uh, suspending these players. So, uh, again, it's so far into uh, the restrictions. Everybody knows them. And we've been ridiculing players right, left and centre and, um, you know, chastising so many who have broken the rules that I'm amazed that, uh, you know, these two Rangers players uh, this late on, would still think they could get away with it. And, and full marks to uh, Stuart Robertson for taking that immediate action on behalf of the board. Um, when you get results over the weekend, we always like to see who Gabriel Antoniazzi is going to pick in his team of the week. Here's the 11. Craig Gordon showed he's still a top-class keeper with several key saves and a strong message to Steve Clark. James Tavernier was ice cold again, scoring his 10th goal of the season from the spot. Connor Goldson has gone to new levels this season and ensured another clean sheet this weekend. Mark Reynolds led his side to a needed victory, which pushed them up to fifth in the table. Stephen Kingsley has been standout for Hearts so far and kept Martin Boyle quiet all game. Tom Rogic always upped his performance at Hamden and did so again, notching two assists. Joe Newell was the best player on the park on Saturday and delivered the perfect ball for Christian Deutsch's goal. Charlie Lackin slipped Ollie Shaw through in the single bright spark for County on Saturday. Ryan Christie scored one of the goals of the season and looks back to his sharp best. Tony Watt is on form right now and made it 2-2 two and two with a real poacher's finish. Nicky Clark fires United to three points with both goals in their victory. There's always one or two, Ruffy, that I think, you know, people might disagree with, but yeah. what do you make of that 11? Yeah, I think maybe Reynolds... Uh... I can't think of anybody off the top of my head, but I don't remember him having a, an outstanding game. But apart from that, yeah, I think uh, yeah. Uh, Boyce, I like the way Boyce put himself a bit in the, the Hibs Hearts game. I thought he he maybe been given a shout in this one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you wanted Reynolds out, but you can't think of anybody who, who would have went in there in well, his place. Well, I thought, be I thought, I thought, I thought Beaton. No, I thought Beaton. I, I'm not a big Beaton fan. Yeah. But I thought he came in uh, and played a lot better than what he usually does. OK, Stevie, uh, who messages uh, the programme on a regular basis, says, I don't rate Gordon. Wow, Stevie, uh, you only have to look at his uh, CV um, to see um, uh, what's been mentioned about Gordon uh, today. I think he deserves all the plaudits. Well worthy of a place in the team of the week. Um, this is the joy of predictions. Uh, it's simply... When you've got Tam McManus so far out in front, you start to get worried, Ruffy. I mean, I, I've over the last eight years, it's been very, very close uh, when we've had the predictions with the pundits. Uh, you've been really close to winning on eight of these years, Ruffy, but sadly, Jeez. I've won eight of them. <laughs> so, and now, and now, and now is we're, midway, we're only midway through this season. There's no Tam. People are wondering where he is. But the reason, Tam, he's got a legitimate reason for not being here. But we can speculate that maybe he didn't want to see, Ruffy, um, the predictions he and as you can see, oh, oh, oh Ruffy, a 13 points is nothing. I, I'm going to reel him in, Ruffy, but I think you might be, you're taking up your usual position in October, Ruffy, where you just completely and utterly fade away. No, I'll come good at the new year, you know, after the festive season, I usually, I usually <laughs> kick in. Uh, but there is, as you can imagine, Mark, there's a, a lot of school duggery going on at this precise moment in time. You know, there's points getting handed out willy nilly oh. now. I think we'll have to get the fix the the regulations out and just tighten them up a wee bit. Right. You Mark, need an you need an educator. Yeah, a fourth Mark, official yes. you need. Yeah. Maybe oh, get Mark. Neil Doncaster a phone. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, let, let's get Mark. Let's get Mark in the Bobby Madden role. Uh, it, we make predictions, Mark, for the five games that were <laughs> taking place at the weekend. And I said to them, "Who do you think will win that match?" And I said, "Hearts will win it two one." I don't know what more you want from it. Uh, you know, whether it's ninety or one hundred and twenty minutes, Mark. We asked Darren Jackson for his prediction on the game, and he said, "I think it'll go to extra time and penalties." And then we said to him, 
well, who's going to win it then? And we still couldn't get it out of him, Ruffy. And we're still waiting for his prediction on it. So <laughs> I don't know what more you want from it. Hearts to, hearts to win the game. And, and so it proved. Um, just a couple of things, um, Mark, uh, two things before we finish. Sad news about Sir Bobby Charlton with dementia. His brother Jack also suffered from that as well. It's something which I think more and more people can see that this um, disease you know, the, there's, a, I think, a greater percentage. And, and obviously the Football Association in England and across uh, the United Kingdom and Europe and the world are looking for the connections between footballers heading the ball and that link to dementia long term. Yeah, I mean, terribly sad about uh, Bobby Charlton. I mean, very brave of him and his family, you know, to come out and declare in a sense, you know, trying to bring attention to it and trying to, you know, support uh, research and everything into it. But yeah, you know, there, there, there have been connections made and I know that, you know, in certain countries, you know, they're, they're now, um, you know, preventing young players from heading the ball. Um, and I think about it, you know, we used to go out there and was, with obsessions for all we did was head these big heavy balls that were soaked wet with we, we, we water on this sort of battlefield training ground or that, you know, and it couldn't have been doing you any good. But you, it was just ignorance. You just didn't know. And, you, you, you know, as coaches, you, you let them do it. And they let us do it. And uh, as players, we did what we were told, you know. So, yeah, it may have, it may have uh, um, you know, caused problems. But, you know, hopefully uh, these problems are starting to get identified and will be dealt with. Yeah, Alison, the, the, the sad fact um, that we're facing at the moment is there are a number of people, uh, because of the um, explosion in television, in radio, uh, you know, in the 20th century, and then, of course, uh, you know, the other explosion of the social media of the 21st century, you get to you get to a situation where the legends that were well known in the sixties and seventies um, and the eighties are, are are passing away. Uh, I mean, Marius Salukas is a is a tragedy for one so young that you certainly wouldn't like to uh, see happen on a regular basis. But the legends that we are losing, um, never mind in football. You know, Sean Connery had a long illness, but. Uh, when you look at Sir Bobby Charlton, he's got dementia. Jack Charlton was lost. Nobby Styles last week. There's a lot of people that I think are looking back with great fondness at lots of football legends that we're losing at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the link with dementia, I think, is one that that the, there's a responsibility to the football authorities to to further explore and, and investigate. I know this time last year they implemented the. <laughs> The ban for for under twelves and and heading the ball as you look to to explore what the connection is, but I think you, they they have a duty of care to all footballers who are coming through the system now, uh, footballers who are playing now, senior professionals who are playing now, but also I think football has a a, a duty to look after players who now find themselves in this position later in life uh, and, and fighting this disease. I think um, I think the, the connection is apparent. We, we might not have all the signs to back it up, which we now need to go and explore and, and have firm evidence. But I think there's a, a, a duty for football to look after its players that have given so much to the game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, growing up, Sir Bobby Charlton was just a, a, a joy to watch, you know, a, a, and a midfielder as well who, you know, Right foot, left foot, what was his best foot? He could hit them from 25, 30 yards, 249 goals uh, in over 700 games. was absolutely blistering stuff. And uh, again, very brave to come out uh, and mention uh, that he has this disease. Uh, now, uh, the five most prolific Champions League strikers of the 21st century um, have been rated at this moment. I have the list in front of me. Um, now, Mark McGee, I'm going to go to you first, just to put you under pressure. Um, can you give me the five most prolific Champions League strikers of the 21st century? And this is a goal average per 90 minutes. Even if you, you don't need to name them in order, but can you give me the five? Well, I thought Ronaldo and Messi would be two of them. Yep, you're in there. Uh, yeah, well, thanks. I, that, those were the easy ones. Um, yes. Uh, Suarez? Suarez is not there. Um, nope. Uh, so I, I'm going to move on to Ruffy now. Ruffy, do you want to help Mark? Out? Lewandowski. He's giving me 
Mark Levin. has given us three. Yeah. Mark has given us yeah. three. I, I uh, would, there... I would, I would hazard the guess at one from just a wee bit further back. Real Madrid. Uh, Raúl. What they? Oh, I thought you were going to say Real, Real Madrid, the entire team, and hope you were going to get no, it right no. from there. No, um, I thought Raúl. Yeah, Raúl was a good. I thought you said, I thought said the twenty-first century. That's what I was just about to correct him on, Mark. It is the 21st century. Um, so Raul would have been a good shout if it had been the 20th century as well, Ruffy. I thought Ali you said 21. Listen. Ibrahimovic. Uh, Ibrahimovic, no. It's somebody that's not well liked in Scotland, Ali. I think that might give you a chance. Boris Johnson. Ruffy. <laughs> I don't think he. I don't think he's. I don't think. He, I don't think he's playing at the moment. Anyway, apart from anything Somebody's else, so well liked. Yeah, Thomas Muller. Thierry Henry. No, no, he doesn't like Thierry Henry. The answer was Neymar. Uh, he's, uh, oh, he's not, um, yeah, and and so the the and the other one is Van Nisselrooy. So their average right. goals per game is incredible if you think about it. Um, and remember, Mark, he had a blistering time at um, a blistering time at Real Madrid too, as well as Manchester United. Um, so the order is Messi first, Neymar second, Ronaldo third, uh, Lewandowski fourth, and Van Nistelrooy. I spotted that on uh, uh, the social media today, and I thought it's an interesting one. I wonder if the boys will get all five. Well done, Mark. You nailed uh, three of them. I have to say, um, Ali, we're well happy with your new studio. It looks fantastic, Ruffy. Are you happy with it, Ruffy? Yeah, I mean, is, yeah, that not giving you, is that not giving you the incentive to build an extension on the farm? It looks as if she's brought in a whole production team there. You know, lighting, oh. no makeup, the lot, you know. Aye. It's just unbelievable. Well, well I, I hate to say this, Ruffy, but because I've got seven sisters and I know exactly which way my sisters would say uh, to you right now, what do you mean with lighting and makeup? Was I not looking okay to start with? <laughs> oh, not at all. It just looks sharper. <laughs> oh, okay. Keep yeah, well done. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Keep digging, Ruffy. Anyway, apart from anything else, Mark, absolutely fantastic. You'll be back with us on Friday again um, to preview the weekend's games. And, of course, uh, there is the small matter of that Serbia game that I'm going to get your thoughts on as well. Top man, uh, Mark McGee, holding the ball in for us at the last minute there, Ruffy, um, because McManus didn't want to actually talk about Hibs being well and truly pumped by the Jambos at the weekend. And on that note, thanks to Mark McGee, Alison McCoy, Alan Ruff and thanks to you don't forget to like share and follow us on Facebook and of course you can subscribe on our YouTube channel we'd love you to join the football family from everyone here thanks for watching expect the best used car deals guaranteed visit arnoldclark.com